going too slow to have a real powerful stand in the market. You might consider a sale. The same applies if your business model simply requires growth um, or if changes in the markets um, um, yeah, sort of make you consider a sales process. And lastly, what I don't hope for anyone is that your company is in crisis and you simply have no alternative to sell. Then there are various personal reasons. Um, the nice ones would be that you uh, simply have enough and would like to cash in and therefore sell your business. Others could be that you yourself have difficulties and would like to sell or it's the family or age or health matters or so very personal reasons which can, which can trigger your interest in, in such a process. What are the alternatives? So instead of selling, what, what else can you do? I mean, you basically have the whole toolkit of restructuring your business, of uh, growing your business um, yourself. Um, you can acquire yourself, obviously, yeah, if, you, if you need uh, the, the growth and cannot do that from just internally, um, you, can, you can do an M&A deal yourself and grow by that. Uh, you can consider a carve-out, which is always very difficult internally, so if you realize that um, you need to focus on your core business and uh, need to get rid of certain less important bits and pieces, that might very well get along with layoffs to your staff, however big your company is. Uh, it doesn't actually matter, layoffs are always very difficult internally. And then the, the third category um, is capital, and that's why probably most of the people are here at NOAA, because they're looking for partners, investors, be it venture capitalists, be it strategic partners uh, who invest into your company, or be it joint venture partners. So let's assume you have decided that all these alternatives do not work for you and you ultimately need to go into, into a sales process. Obviously, you want to achieve the best price possible for your business. Um, that is commercially the key factor. Uh, clearly, it's not your option, but a matter of markets, a matter of negotiations, what you can, what you can ultimately achieve. There's a whole variety, and I could spend literally two days on purchase price clauses in, in share purchase agreements. Really just some highlights or to give you an idea of the variety which is available. Um, so the most usual thing is that you get your purchase price in cash. You can, as an alternative, also get shares in the buying company. Um, so some kind of share swap, which is very typical in the US and now increasingly seen in Germany as well. Then it's fixed versus variable. Um, that also has a massive impact on, for us lawyers on the drafting of the purchase agreements uh, in the end. Uh, so do you agree with the buyer on a fixed purchase price, which is sort of set in stone based on, based on um, uh, certain financial data on a defined date, and then you will need to consider how the period be between that cutoff date and the ultimate closing date um, is covered uh, in the agreement. Or do you do a purchase price adaptation, so a variable purchase price, which um, is then usually adapted on the basis of so-called closing date accounts, so that you agree on a date which shall be the cutoff, and then you establish a set of account and uh, looking at certain, at certain balance sheet items, you adapt the purchase price. The third one is, do you get, obviously if you, if you get a purchase price in cash, you want to cash in the sooner the better. Um, so the, the question is, do I get that payment immediately or is the buyer asking for deferred payment? And that in particular applies, and that's the fourth category here, um, if the buyer wants um, that certain a certain portion of the purchase price is put into escrow or held back, and the buyer usually does that if they fear that you could be in breach of certain of the guarantees you're giving. Yeah, so when you're selling your business, you're um, making a couple of um, a couple of statements in relation to that business, and the buyer is relying on them, um, and you are on the hook for them. You're liable, and 
obviously the buyer is afraid if two years after closing, when they realize, uh, oh, they have a guarantee claim, you will probably or likely have already spent all the purchase price or have given that to your family, so your pockets are empty. And that in particular applies if you are not selling personally, but uh, let's assume you, you have a German GmbH on sale and uh, it is not held by you personally, but by your Luxembourg Saal, which you have put in place for tax reasons. And that Saal is now selling the shares. Um, after receipt of the purchase price, you will distribute the funds internally and when the buyer goes after the Saal in two years' time, there's no money left. So in that regard, holdbacks or escrow accounts are very, very common in the market. And the other side of the coin would be so-called earn-out clauses, which you um, very often see in the tech market and now again increasingly in Germany. So um, there are statistics uh, where you never know how, how much you can trust them. In, in, our, in our experience and what we see in the office, it's around 40 to 50 percent of the tech deals which now have earn-out clauses. What, what does it mean? Um, it uh, basically incentivizes the founder, in particular in structures where the founder stays on board for another period of time um, as managing director in the company, incentivizes them um, yeah, to stay motivated because um, they will only receive a certain portion of the purchase price at a later point in time and um, usually contingent upon the fulfillment of certain milestones. So that is how you are kept incentivized by a buyer. So now moving on to the sales process, what are the typical phases? And we've split that up into four main phases. Um, phase one is preparation, phase two is market approach, phase three is the negotiation, closing, uh, signing and closing phase, and then ultimately which is not really a legal topic, um, but a business topic, a very important one is integration, so that the acquired business will be integrated into the buyer's business. Um, we've tried to sum it up in a, in a timeline and we will go uh, through the different phases in detail. Uh, again, as a rule of thumb, and it's difficult to, to say that in absolute figures, but uh, very often, especially founders, underestimate uh, how much time and effort such a sales process takes. Um, we usually say it's between 6 and 12 months. It can last much longer, obviously, but shorter than 6 months is very hard to achieve from day one until closing. It's rarely seen and would be uh, extremely stressful for everyone involved. Um, it's always more than you think. Yeah, so uh, as I said, it's very often underestimated how much um, time and effort you need to spend. And that in particular applies to phase one, preparation. So prepare, prepare, prepare. That's an overriding theme which uh, I think is, uh, is very helpful. Um, um, of course, you, if you are a founder who wants to sell, no one knows your business better than you. And that often leads to the impression, well, then I can sell it in a minute. I can explain everything in a minute and there's no need to prepare. But in our experience, that is not true. Um, what different topics should that preparation cover? Should obviously analyze the market. You should get aligned internally. So get your stakeholders on board, in particular if you're not alone. Yeah. Um, make sure that, that you are aligned. You should do a SWOT analysis, and if you identify weak spots, which there always are, then uh, it, it, this is the time in the process where you should start um, rectifying or at least mitigating them, because later on, when you have to manage your business, which shall continue to be very successful, and a sales process, it will not be possible. You will simply not have any more time left to do that. You should... Um, it's the last point here, but very important, obviously, standing here as a legal advisor, you should um, select and engage advisors, and that's not only legal advisors, but also, for example, tax advisors very early in the process, in particular, if you have um, a yeah, not so straightforward structure for your financials or for your uh, business and want to make sure that you do that in a very tax-efficient manner, um, that is also very important to do that early on in the process. Um, 
and then due diligence will come to that later. Uh, you cannot start early enough uh, looking into your, into your documents and preparing your, your company for a diligence process done by the buyer. Um, on the advisory side, it's not only legal or tax advisors, but um, very common, and there are many of them here, and actually one of them is a sponsor, is, is, the, is the host of this conference, the NOAA guys, they're also M&A advisors. So that is probably the group of, of advisors which you will definitely take on board, um, investment bankers or M&A advisors who will guide you through the process, who can help you um, approach the market, who have knowledge and experience, and they are, by and large, the group which, which is taken on board um, first, uh, and then tax and legal advisors to follow. So um, how do I approach the bidders or the markets? Um, and uh, by the way, of course, if, whenever you have any questions, just raise your hand and, and shout it out. So firstly, you need to decide um, who to approach. Um, you usually see so-called long lists and short lists. Your advisors will help you. You and your, um, your team of managers will, will put that together um, with the aim to, to come up with a consolidated list of, um, of buyers who might actually be interested in acquiring your company. A very important document is the first one because, as you know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. It's the so-called teaser. That's the very first, like your elevator pitch when, when you're pitching to, to finance years. This is the document you're pitching to buyers. Um, and uh, that, uh, by experience, should also rather be um, well thought through than done very quickly. Yeah? Um, because, uh, as I said, uh, if you miss out on something in there or it just doesn't look right, you will not be attractive for a buyer. The next bit is uh, the NDA, the Non-Disclosure Agreement. Uh, come on, you're telling, starting to tell them the secrets of your business, so you want to make sure that that is properly protected. We'll come to the details of an NDA a bit later, uh, when it gets more legal, um, finally. And then the data room and further information. Yeah. So due diligence processes um, are extremely important for every buyer. And when you only start preparing a data room, for example, where you put all the information which is relevant for your company and your business, when you only start doing that, when already approaching bidders, that's actually too late. So you should try to have that in order basically all the time when running your company. It's like when you want to sell your car, what will you do before you present it to a buyer? You will bring it to the car wash, you will probably um, uh, vacuum the, the interior once more, and you will look for the paperwork and put that um, uh, into a nice folder so that everything looks in order and no one realizes that your car has been a mess for the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, so that, that is extremely important, get sorted. So, uh, as I said, the NDA, that's one of the first actual legal documents in the process. Um, and what you want to make sure is that you define in such document um, what information shall be confidential and how that shall be treated. You need to make sure that you define what kind of use is permitted, and even more importantly, who may have access to it. So what you usually do is that you define a small group of people within the buyer plus their advisors who may have access um, uh, to that kind of information. And ideally, but quite tough to negotiate from a, from a seller's point of view, is that you also add some kind of penalty yeah? in case of a breach of confidentiality. You know, the easiest for you would be to simply get a contractual penalty in the amount of XYZ, but um, that is not always achievable in the negotiations. What you usually also have in NDAs is a so-called non-solicitation clause. Yeah, in the process, the buy side will get access to your management, to your key employees, and what you obviously want to avoid is that they realize after 
looking into your company for a week, um, well, if we get uh, X, Y, and Z out of there, basically have the main skill set and can do the same business elsewhere. Um, so you want to make sure that, that they do not solicit any of your personnel during the sales process. And then you have um, uh, like some usual terms where obviously you need to, to state the term. Yeah? So for how long is the NDA running? What do you have to do if the process doesn't come through? Yeah? And if the buyer um, walks away or if the, the process is aborted for any other reason, what shall happen to information delivered to the buyer? Um, that's actually a legal practice, something where you often have a disconnect because the sell side then wants to have like two pages with very detailed language where you say how uh, information and documents um, need to be destroyed and that you need to evidence how that has been destroyed. And that actually stems from a time when there was much more paperwork. And these days where everything is electronically um, saved, it's a bit more difficult. And um, yeah, also for us lawyers, then actually proving that something has definitely been destroyed, no copies anywhere, that's quite difficult to achieve. But still, you want something on that in there, just to make sure that information doesn't sit on on the on the bidder's um, email box for for very much longer. And then, lastly, um, there are here some exceptions. That's what I wanted to mention as well. Um, so, what is confidential information? What is no longer confidential? Everything which is in the public domain doesn't um, isn't be considered or won't be considered confidential anymore. And you, in particular, if you have um, a bidder who's a publicly listed company, then uh, they would need an exception uh, to be permitted to disclose information if their stock exchange rules demand so. Um, so that is um, usually a caveat a cover -out in here as well. Phase three the most important one for us lawyers, the negotiation phase. Um, that again has uh, various, um, various key items, um, and we will go through them in more detail. The letter of intent is following the NDA, the second um, legal document which is usually signed. Um, this is now also the phase where in parallel to negotiations, the due diligence will take place the purchase agreement will be drafted either by the sell side or the buy side and will be put on the table so that you can start negotiating it. There are, depending on the structure of the deal, a ton of ancillary documents. So it's not just the purchase agreement in which you agree on the purchase of the shares in the company or in, in, in these structures less common on an asset sale but there are a variety of ancillary documents. For example, security documents. Yeah, so um, if uh, you are not certain whether the buyer will be actually able to pay the purchase price, you might want to get a guarantee from their parents. Um, then uh, very often in all jurisdictions, you need certain board resolutions, which um, ultimately only enable the parties involved to make the deal. All those kinds of things will need to be prepared at this time as well. Um, then also during this phase as part of the due diligence, management and customer interviews might take place. So the buyer who's now really interested in looking into all the details, um, he will start asking your customers um, uh, how you operate and um, find out whether there are any risks associated. And then we ultimately come to the signing and then to the closing phase. So this is the phase three negotiations, and um, the second legal document which I mentioned is the letter of intent, the LOI. There are many other terms for that, like MOUs, memoranda of understanding, or term sheets, or deal memos, or heads of terms, or whatever. Um, they all differ, they're all different, but basically they pretty much m mean the same, and um, the the baseline is that they are all non-binding. That's the general topic. So someone is expressing their interest and uh, you are signing a document with them, but it doesn't mean that the deal is already done. 
lawyers, there are always exceptions to rules. So if I say it's non-binding, that uh, is not entirely true because there are certain provisions of an LOI, and let's stick to that term for the purposes of this uh, talk. Um, there are certain clauses which you obviously want to be binding, uh, and those include the confidentiality clause or um, the exclusivity period, which is something the buyer will most likely ask as part of the letter of intent, yeah, where you basically are obligated to discontinue negotiations with other parties, and if you don't do so, you will have to cover costs incurred by the buyer until that point in time. That obviously has to be binding as well. Um, and then in the EU, and especially in Germany, we have the so-called principle of culpa and contrahendo, Latin expression, uh, which means that you are in breach of pre-contractual obligations. Very generally speaking, before you have signed the deal, you're not bound. But if you are unreasonably walking away from, from a transaction and have given the other side the impression we are already there and the deal will happen tomorrow, I only need my board approval, and then on the next day you simply don't answer the phone anymore, um, under very rare and strict circumstances you might be liable for certain damages incurred by the seller in, in such event. Very hard to prove, but something um, you always need to mention uh, from a legal perspective when people sign this non-binding document that still certain obligations might arise from that. So what else does the LOI cover? It includes an indicative purchase price and that, that obviously is very important but uh, also very important is that you understand the background of the purchase price, the structure, how has the bidder calculated such purchase price because if you are in a bidding process and are talking to four, to four potential buyers, you want to compare. And if you just have a blank number you, or a sheer number, you won't be able to do so. So that is, that is also important. Um, usually you set out the timetable, which you are never going to comply with, but you still put it in there yeah, so that both sides have at least an impression of how long the process shall take. And uh, what you also already put in the LOI, ideally, if you, if you have an idea of that, is uh, if there should be any further conditions to signing and closing. So if you know you really need your internal board approvals or if you know that you still need um, financing on the buy side, then you might want to include those as conditions. And the probably most common closing condition that you see in European deals is that you need antitrust approval. That only applies if you really have bigger deals, um, but still it's, um, it's very important because um, you cannot close a deal if you require merger control clearance, and if you don't have that, you just cannot close. Um, due diligence. As I said, that's basically the Eldorado of all kinds of advisors um, because there's so many things you can review in a company depending on what the company is doing exactly. Um, there are now um, very um, well-esteemed software and hardware um, due diligence providers. Uh, you obviously can send in auditors to do financial due diligence. You can do tax due diligence. Um, there are experts for employment and benefits due diligence, um, which um, if, if not reviewed correctly can, can be a huge uh, cost risk, cost risk in, in the transaction process. And obviously we as uh, lawyers, we do legal due diligence. Um, what, what does a legal due diligence cover? There are various items um, uh, uh, or in more general, what, what do due diligences cover and what are the various elements that you see. We already discussed data rooms. Um, I don't know how many of you have done M&A processes like a while back, 10 years ago, or in industries which are strictly confidential. Um, these days we, we are used to operating in so-called virtual data rooms. So it's basically for us as lawyers, it's a des desktop review. You sit at your desk and you have access to a whole lot of documents which you can print out hopefully and if not you need to read them on the screen and then you make your summaries and where's the risk, where's the risk. 
Um, in former times, which was um, much different, uh, we, had, we had actual physical data rooms on site at the target or the seller. Um, you had uh, like 50 lights folders on the table and um, you needed to surrender your laptop, your cell phone and everything else and had a pencil and a piece of paper and then you could make your summaries. Uh, in further advanced technology cycles, we were then allowed to bring your dictation devices so that you can at least um, dictate what you've read. But those times are, are mostly gone. Uh, another part of the due diligence process is the Q&A. Uh, again, a variety of uh, opportunities to do so. Most data room providers offer Q&A tools online. Um, we as advisors have our own access sheet tools or whatever. Um, what you just want to make sure for both sell side and buy side is that you have everything in one place yeah? because um, later on you just want to make sure that there's one source where all the questions and all the answers are stored. Management interviews are already mentioned. Site visits, um, obviously if you operate out of uh, um, premises in Berlin Mitte with 15 people, that's maybe less important if you have 25 outlets across the republic. Um, it's more important, and even more so if you are in the manufacturing business, then a buyer obviously will want to see how things work on site. Um, customer interviews are also mentioned as well. And then the last point is actually very important because um, once that process started, um, as mentioned before, it will be very effort taking and time consuming. But um, never forget that due diligence is not a one-way street. So you just want to make sure yourself that the buyer is up to the promises they are making. So you want to make a proper KYC check on the buyer. You will want them to deliver documents which evidence that yeah, they are really good for the money they are offering you. Yeah, because if not, you might either not want to pursue discussions with uh, such buyer or and put in safety mechanisms for yourself. What does a legal due diligence cover typically? Um, in legal due diligence, when looking at a business for sale, it's usually a company, as I said, it's a so-called share deal. The most important thing you want to make sure is that the party who's selling you something is actually owning it. Uh, so that's the so-called title, what we are looking at. Um, you will want to understand uh, the financial situation. Uh, so from a legal perspective, you look at credit agreements, loan agreements, shareholder loans, whatever. Um, then very important for tech, obviously, software and IP. Um, data protection and other compliance is also a key item and cannot be missed out in any due diligence. And then there are yeah, a few other, which are typically highlights like the main agreements with customers and suppliers where the buyer would like to understand if there are any risks, and in particular, uh, so-called change of control risks. Yeah, so if you have, as a seller, as the owner, been able to negotiate an excellent deal with uh, one of your customers or suppliers, um, but that is pretty much contingent upon you being involved. And if they have a change of control termination right or a key man clause, then uh, the buyer might need, to might need to have to renegotiate the terms and if that is to his detriment, um, that, that will have an impact on the purchase price. And uh, the last bit is also very important for emerging and young businesses um, because that is basically an area where we, like in IP, often see that growing companies have dif might have difficulties um, uh, to, to be in a very well sorted manner uh, that is employment, and in Germany in particular, the distinction between employees and freelancers, where um, ultimately you have a social security and wage tax risk um, if you have not, not drawn the line properly. And the purpose of the due diligence, um, obviously from a buyer's perspective, is to identify risks. Yeah? And those risks will either have an impact on the purchase price, so if the buyer ultimately says, I've identified these following five risks, I'm still interested, but I'm only willing to pay less, or they will seek for coverage under the purchase agreement. Yeah, so then you would have to give all kinds of reps and warranties and guarantees um, to secure the buyer. The 
the core for us lawyers is the purchase agreement. I'm only covering that very shortly here um, because it, as on the purchase price mentioned before, I could fill like two days with a workshop with a workshop on on a purchase agreement. Um, but what are the what are the main topics or what is the typical content? You obviously need to define the purchased goods. In our case, um, what we've been discussing will be the shares in the company, then the purchase price clause with all kinds of adaptation mechanisms, or if you have a fixed purchase price, a lockbox mechanism, lock box mechanism sorry, where you make sure that, that you have no leakage, that no funds are withdrawn from the company. You would um, include uh, any conditions to close, um, antitrust, merger control I mentioned before, um, then the guarantees and liability sections um, where the, it's again very commercial, um, where you, you see in the market all sorts of limitations. Um, uh, so from a seller's side, uh, you might want to consider a so-called de minimis clause, which means um, that if you are in breach of a guarantee and the damage for the buyer is very small, you just might not want to fight about that. Yeah, so if it's only 1,500 euros, no one really wants to hire lawyers and, and, and start arguing, so you define a minimum threshold that a damage must reach. Um, and uh, then on the other, other end, sort of, um, you agree on a cap, usually. Yeah, so that, as a seller, what you definitely want to avoid is that you are on hook for more than you are getting. Yeah, so even for the core, for what you're selling, the shares, you would want to introduce that you are not liable for amounts which exceed the purchase price, because then um, that would be that would, would would be a very bad deal for you. Guarantees and liabilities we covered. What are the remedies? So it's usually damages, claim for damages that you would have to make the other side whole in cash. And uh, if you have a period between signing and closing, so the date on which you sign the purchase agreement or in Germany, I don't know how many of you know that funny thing that you need to go to the notary where the entire 97 pages of the agreement are read, read aloud loud and you have to listen uh, before you sign. Uh, so that is the signing date. And then uh, really depending on whether you have, for example, conditions to close the actual closing, so the date when the economic transfer of the shares happens, that is later on. So there's a period between signing and closing. And in that period, the seller and the seller's management will still be in charge. And from a buyer's side, you obviously want to make sure that they do that properly. And those are the so-called covenants which stipulate or regulate the conduct between signing and closing. So now you have signed and you have closed and the deal has gone through the integration phase. Um, and as I said before, that's mainly a business matter. Yeah? That's where then the buyer will um, introduce and um, integrate the acquired business into their existing business, if any. Yeah? It might also be that they just keep the company as is. Um, it will depend on if you have a founder who's still on board as managing director, um, that would be very important in that integration phase, um, how this works out, and if you need an agreement just to cover this, besides the managing service agreement. Do you need any transitional services, for example? So if the sell side has certain knowledge um, which the company still needs for a year or two to properly do its business, you you will enter into a tra transitional services agreement. Um, so that, that's um, also the integration phase. And then um, from the time of the uh, execution of the purchase agreement, there might still be leftovers uh, to be completed. If the purchase price is subject to an adaptation, that will happen at some point in time when the company is already owned by the buyer. So that's part of the integration phase. During that phase, at some point in time, the limitation periods um, for your guarantees will lapse. So that, that is usually then a point in time when, when everyone takes a final look whether everything was in order or not. 
um, if there were holdbacks or earnouts on the purchase price agreed between you, then this is also the time when, when those are finally dispersed. And what you also very often see, if the founder, in our example, then at some point in time finally goes um, um, or ultimately leaves the company, um, you will in all likelihood be subject to so-called non-compete obligations. Yeah, so you have to sign a paper that you don't go around the corner and do the very same business elsewhere. Um, this is regulated in the EU and especially in Germany, so you would still have to compensate that person during that time, but it's also very important and absolutely market standard. So, um, and uh, that also brings us, already brings us to the end of the presentation. In, in our experience, what are the keys to a successful process? So the first one, very obvious, you need to be an attractive target, otherwise you will not get attractive bids. You must do a very proper market analysis, uh, at the end of which the result can also be it's not the right time to sell. Yeah, simply be patient, have to wait. You must align your uh, interests internally, so make sure that, um, that you have a consensus among all the necessary stakeholders. Prepare, prepare, prepare. I mentioned that a couple of times. Choose your advisors wisely. Um, it's also often seen as a necessary evil, but um, if you, if you um, appoint your advisors at the right point in time and pick the right advisors, um, they really can add value. Timing is, as always, of the essence in these processes, and then ultimately try to control the process as much as you can at your side, um, because everything else will give the buyer yeah, basically a, a bad impression. So when I say that uh, you need to choose your advisors uh, wisely, um, we at GT Law are, of course, very happy to help with any legal questions that may arise in such processes or and anything else which relates to business law, we here in our German office basically cover all areas of business law, and in particular in the tech sector. Uh, I'm, as I said, in the corporate M&A department. We also have real estate. We have a technology and telecoms department which solely focuses on commercial and regulatory work in relation to tech businesses. Um, we do media and entertainment infrastructure and transportation. We have a finance and restructuring team, which is very rare to have in Berlin. Um, and uh, finally, government and regulatory and also litigation, which includes employment and benefits as well. So we really cover, cover that all, and um, that has been it. Just on time, I think. Are there any questions? Very well, I'm still around, so if you just want to pop by and ask a question, I'm very happy to answer that. I would like to thank you very much for coming this early in the morning, and have a great day at NOAA. Thank you. Thank you very much.